We're happy that you can join us today. In case you need prayer, email or send us a private message via the GCF channels indicated on your screen. Send us a message before the worship begins or once it's over. A GCFer will try to reach you within the day. If you need to be prayed for over the phone, include your phone number so we can contact you. Thank you and have a great day.
Let's worship the Lord through this hymn. Yeah, 
Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to Green Hills Christian Fellowship. I am Pastor B.J. Sebastian. And a good morning and a good day to all of you, whether you are listening to us on radio or online, through YouTube or Facebook, I welcome you to our worship service this morning. Psalm 8 says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens, out of the mouth of babies and infants. You have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let us pray. Father, we welcome you this morning. We enter into your presence with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise. We thank you that we have the privilege of worship and we come today to worship you and to lift up your name in all the earth. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let us praise and worship our God in song. Another blessed Sunday, church. Let's sing and worship to our God. Together. Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. Rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord our God. You reign forever. Our Lord, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God. The ever
sing hallelujah, hallelujah, praise the one who set me free, hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me, you have broken every chain, there's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my name. Beloved, we now come to the part of our worship where we can praise God with the offerings that we bring to Him. And we will do that now, even if we are scattered as a church. Beloved, on the screens, you will find ways by which you can give to our Lord and to our Lord's work. We have indicated there the bank account numbers and details of Green Hills Christian Fellowship. So should the Lord move you in your heart to give an offering unto Him. You may do so through Instapay or Pesonet. Or you can go to our website, gcf.org.ph slash give, and you can give through your credit card or through PayPal or even through Gcash or PayMaya. If you wish to receive a receipt, then please email. The details are on the screen before you. If you wish to designate an offering for our COVID-19 relief, please do inform us by emailing the same address and indicating your designated offering. Let us now worship our God in our offerings. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Beloved, let us offer to God with grateful and cheerful hearts. Beloved, we come now to our community prayer. When we come together as a church to lift up our prayers unto the Lord, we do this with great confidence that He hears us and He answers according to His will. Psalm 5 says, Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. Give attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God, for to you do I pray. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. Almighty God, our eternal Father, we thank you this morning for gathering us once again to worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you that you are our God and we are your people, the sheep of your pasture. We thank you, Lord, that we have a relationship with you through Christ Jesus, our Savior. We thank you for our salvation, Lord, that great salvation that you have procured for us, initiated by the Spirit worked by Christ on the cross, perfected by you in heaven, kept in heaven for us 
who believe in you. What a great salvation we have in Christ. We thank you, Father, for this great salvation. And we praise you every moment of our lives for such a great redemption in your Son's blood. Father, this morning, as we approach you, we are keenly aware of your great holiness before us and our great sinfulness before you. We pray and come to you and confess our sins before you, our God. We are a stubborn and stiff-necked race. We are unfaithful to you even if you are always faithful to us. We do the things that you command us not to do and not do the things that you've commanded us to do. We are wretched men, O Lord, and only Christ can save us from this body of death that is attached to us. O Lord, will you forgive us our sins that we confess to you this morning? Will you show your faithfulness and your justice towards us? As we confess our sins to you, Lord, we are in, encouraged in your word and assured in your word that you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Will you do that, Father, for the sake of Christ, our Savior? Will you do that, Lord, for your praise and your glory? Will you do it, Father, for the majesty of your name? that you might be praised in all the earth and all the heavens. Thank you, Father, for the assurance of forgiveness that we have in your word and in Christ. Father, this morning, we come together to pray for our country. We are faced with a significant threat to our economy. This lockdown and this pandemic has caused our economy to decline, businesses to close, establishments to cease operations and for jobs of millions of people father to be lost there are many of us lord who have shut down our businesses and lost our jobs our sources of income are gone and we are left father to the mercy of the economy that is now in peril we commit this problem to you, O oh God, and we commit our leaders to you that you might guide them with your wisdom, Father, so that they might do that which will be beneficial for the whole country and for the interest of the nation. We pray, O oh God, that their decisions might be guided by your wisdom and by your grace and mercy in their hearts. We pray for all of them who are in leadership, Father. We pray for their protection, we pray for wisdom, and we pray especially that they may, might, might come to a saving knowledge of you and that they might have an intimate walk with you, O God. We pray this for all of our leaders, beginning with our president and our vice president, all the cabinet members, all the members of the legislature and our judiciary, all the members of our armed forces and the police force, and all the local government leaders and servants who are ministers of you ordained by you to promote good and to restrain evil we come to you for them we come to you for aid to our country we pray for an end to this pandemic we pray for the discovery of a vaccine we pray oh god that in your wisdom you might cause all of this crisis to end for the sake of your people, have mercy on us, O oh God, and bring this crisis to an end. But should you will not to, we will abide in you. We will dwell in you. We will rest in your care, knowing that you are able to provide for us and to protect us. We pray for all of those who are sick with COVID. We pray for all of the families, Father, of those who are sick with COVID who might be threatened themselves. We pray for those who, who grieve for loved ones uh, whom we have lost because of COVID-19 and other sicknesses, oh God. Will you give them comfort at this time? And will you provide for all of their needs, oh Lord? We pray that you might give us 
courage, and perseverance to withstand this time of persecution and oppression and trial and difficulty that is being caused by this pandemic. You are in this, O God, and you are in control of this. So it is only to you that we pray for a solution and an end to this. Do this, Father, in accordance with your will and for the glory and the sake of your name. Father, we pray as a church for our fellowship that you might use us mightily in the spreading of the gospel, especially during this dark time, for the encouragement of those who are grieving and who are worried and anxious, for providing help to those who are lacking because they have lost their jobs or their sources of income. We pray that you might empower your church to do all of these things, O God, for the furtherance of your kingdom and for the glory of your name. And now, O God, as we continue our worship service this morning, this day, we pray that you might bless each part, especially the reading of your word and the preaching of it, O God. Will you send a strong and encouraging message for us all today? We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. My name is Jefferson Tan, and I'm part of the True Stay Growth Group ever since 2013. I grew up in growth groups and small groups. I uh, entered GCF in the Sunday School program, grew up in the youth ministry where growth groups there are called Y groups, and have been part of growth groups ever since. Upon graduating college and entering the workforce, I saw the value of staying in growth groups just to keep me grounded amongst the busyness and the confusion of the workplace and with all the other added responsibilities I also have at home. Growth groups for me complete the picture. You attend Sunday services where you get to grow in God's Word and have uh, community worship with people that you know share the same faith as you even though you don't get to know them personally. You may serve in ministry where you get to really apply what God has been telling you and even making God's word known to other people. But just being in a growth group allows you to have that community and that fellowship within people that you get to trust. You get to get inspired by how God has been moving in their lives and you get to just be accountable as well to them, opening up your life and your burdens to them. So if you're looking for a group to help you through trouble sometimes, especially at times like now, why don't you join the growth group? Join me if you can. 
Beloved, we have come to the reading of the Lord's Scriptures, and we will find our Scripture text today in Psalm 91, and we will be reading all the verses from verse 1 through 16. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you, to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder. The young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. May the Lord bless his word in our hearts. Amen. Beloved, now we come to the worship of God through the preaching of his word, which is very central in our church here in Green Hills Christian Fellowship. We read his word and we explain the sense of it. That is how we preach here in GCF. Will you now cause your ears to listen and your hearts to be open to the message of the Lord? We continue in our series on the Psalms, which we call songs to keep your life in tune. The title of our message this morning is Dwelling in the Shelter of the Most High. Dwelling in the shelter of the Most High. 
And we will be looking at Psalm, Psalm 91, verses 1 through 16, which I read for you earlier. The historical context and author of this psalm is not given to us in the usual introductory notes that some of the psalms have. But the language of the psalm pictures a leader who is encouraging those who are facing the manifold dangers of life in Israel. Perhaps during the time of Moses, some commentators actually say that this is like Psalm 91 written by Moses, but there is not enough evidence to support that. Or maybe during the time of Joshua, when they were conquering the land, the promised land of uh, Canaan. Or perhaps even during the time of David, when he was king. We're not sure who the author is, but we are sure that this is from a godly leader encouraging those who are um, feeling the dangers of this life and the pressures of their existence as a nation or as a people of God. Some see this as a messianic psalm because the language also points perhaps to the ultimate fulfillment of its promises when Christ establishes his millennial kingdom, when the perfection of God's protection will be achieved because Christ will be on the throne, leading his millennial kingdom here on earth. But it's probably best to understand this in its plain sense of being an encouragement to the people of God of any period of time, including our time, who are anxious about the dangers of living life in general. Psalm 91 is timely to study, especially during this time of an unprecedented crisis like this. It is one of the most comforting and encouraging psalms in the Psalter, and it is acknowledged as such by many pastors, many Christians and believers throughout the ages. The current pandemic has hit close to home because many of us have friends and even loved ones who have fallen victim to this COVID-19 disease, who have lost their businesses, their sources of income, and their jobs. But this psalm encourages those who are anxious about their adverse situation from the perspective of someone who has experienced the actual deliverance of the Lord in his life. In this psalm, we will learn the precious truth that nothing can harm a believer or a child of God unless the Lord permits it. And that the child of God is, in one sense, invincible until it is his or her time to go home to the Father. What a great assuring thought. But this should never be interpreted as a guarantee against danger and disease. Because abiding in the Lord also includes living in His will. Which can include trials and tribulations that are designed to make us more like His Son, Jesus Christ. Even for the Israelites to whom this psalm was originally addressed... Enjoying the promises here in this great psalm was conditioned on their being in the will of God. And that sometimes involved their chastening and refining as a people of God. Psalm 91 encourages us with three precious truths that describe what it means to be dwelling in the shelter of the Most High. First, he who trusts God is secure. Second, he who is secure in God, God is able to protect. Third, he who loves God is saved. So he who trusts God is secure. He who, he who is secure in God, God is able to protect. And he who loves God is saved. Let's go to the first. He who trusts in God is secure. Firstly, he lives in the presence of God. You will see that in verse 1 and in the first part of verse 9. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And verse, verse 9 says, the first part, because you have made the Lord your dwelling place. So both verses actually talk about dwelling 
in the Lord. This opening verse is the same as Psalm 90 verse 1, which says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. That's why frequently Psalm 90 and Psalm 91 are sort of read together. And that brought the, uh, the speculation that perhaps Moses was the author of both. Now, this is a strong statement about Israel belonging to God as a people of his treasured possession. Deuteronomy 7, 6 says that. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And for us believers, and for believers throughout the ages, this is also a declaration that we belong to God as his people and he to us as our God. 1 Peter 2.9, of course, tells us, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The words dwell and abide in these verses mean to inhabit permanently so that this is a picture of a permanent and forever relationship with God, to be at home with Him, to consider Him as our home in the same way that we consider our spouses as our home, our families as our home. We are to consider God in our relationship with Him as our home. We are at home when we are in God. Psalm 32, 7 says, You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. The word shelter and shadow suggest a secret or hidden place. That what's, that's what shelter means. And shadow means a covering or a shade of protection. This describes what God is to his people, a place of safety and protection. Isaiah 32 tells us, uh, 32 verse 2, Each will be like a hiding place from the wind, a shelter from the storm, like streams of water in a dry place, like the shade of a great rock in a weary land. That's a wonderful picture of who God is to his children. The names for God here are important. They are Elion, the Most High, Shaddai, the most powerful, the Almighty, and they all tell us of the sovereignty and power of the God who is our dwelling place. He is able to control all things and has the power in the universe, all the power in the universe, to ensure our safety and our security. Hebrews 1.3, of course, as speaking of Christ as the last revelation of God, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature, and He upholds the universe by the word of His power. Now we who believe in Him live in the presence of a God who is able to assure us of safety and security. Acts 17, 28, when Paul was preaching in Athens, he mentioned, In Him we live and move and have our being. So he who is secure in God lives in the presence of God. Secondly, he trusts in the protection of God. Uh, verse 2, in the second half of verse 9, um, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And then second half of verse 9 says, the most high who is my refuge. So the same thought, those two verses have the same thought. The Lord is described here with the names Yahweh or Jehovah, the covenant-keeping God. That's usually the word used when, it, when he is portrayed as the covenant or a promise-keeping God. And Elohim, which is the word that is used of him when, it's, when, when he is being described as the powerful creator God. Now, this tells us that he is faithful to keep his promises to his people. He's a covenant-keeping God. And has all the power to carry them out, to carry out all of his covenants, to carry out all of his promises. No. Psalm 18.2 says, The Lord is my rock 
and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, the Lord, my God. The Lord here is a refuge in the midst of a storm, a fortress in the face of our enemies, a safe harbor in stormy seas, just like uh, how uh, Psalm 46, 1 to 3 uh, describes him. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, through the, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. The key to having a relationship with God is to trust Him. The verse says, in whom I trust. And this means to entrust both our eternal salvation and our temporal existence to Him. To believe in the person and the promises of His chosen one, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. John 5.24 tells us, with Christ telling us, actually, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. To trust in him and to put our faith in him is to live in him, to dwell in him, and to rest in him. The Lord said that in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So he who trusts in God is secure. He lives in God and trusts in God. Secondly, he who is secure in God, God is able to protect. Firstly, from the dangers of the battle. Verses 3 to 8. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. The dominant pronoun in these verses is you, which suggests that these dangers or the verses here can be applied personally by the reader of this psalm. So it's a very personal address. Many of the images used here also seem to suggest kind of a battle scene. And this certainly applies to the Israelites because of the many battles that they went through under Moses, under Joshua, under David. In our context today, faced with the many dangers in our present world, life can indeed be likened to a battle that we are waging, especially against the world if we are believers. The snare of the fowler is a trap that is set before a prey or an intended victim. The deadly pestilence was a disease or a plague that frequently threatened soldiers in their battle encampments. This tells us that our great God is able to protect us from or deliver us through people or situations that seek to entrap us or even diseases that threaten our lives. How relevant. Verse 4 paints a picture of a mother eagle covering her young with her wings to protect them from predators, the kind of protection that a buckler and shield gives to a soldier. So you can see the imagery. This assures us that our God is powerful enough to cover us from the enemies of our soul who seek to deceive us into disobedience. And his faithfulness, or the promises contained in his word, that's another way to view his faithfulness, is able to protect us from discouragement and despair, just like a shield and a buckler protects a soldier. The terror of the night and the arrow that flies by day paints a picture of the constant threat 
that soldiers face in the battlefield. That's in verse 5. The image is paralleled in verse 6, actually, by the term, the pestilence that stalks in darkness, which parallels terror of the night, and the destruction that weighs at noonday, which parallels the arrow that flies by day. In short, these are imagery of battle threats to the lives of soldiers. These verses tell us that our powerful God is able to take away our fear of these kinds of danger that war against our faith, life-threatening diseases like what we have today, the danger of crime and criminal activity that we face every day, oppression, persecution, and all of these things that war against our faith that make our life seem like a battlefield. These verses tell us that our powerful God is able to take away our fear of all of those kinds of dangers because of the protection that he provides us. Verse 7 talks about thousands and 10,000 that fall by the soldier's side in battle. You see, the Hebrew language has no higher value than 10,000. That's why they're limited to that. But it just paints you a picture of soldiers dying all around uh, the battlefield. But verse 8 is a promise of a soldier's survival so that he can see the recompense of the wicked. So he'll not, he will not perish like the thousands and the tens of thousands who perish around him. He will be able to live to see the recompense of the wicked or the death of his enemies before him. Our God is able to protect us from all the dangers of the battle of life that we wage against the enemies of our souls and the system of this world that is opposed to God and his chosen people. So he who is secure in God is protected from the dangers of life's battles and also, secondly, from the dangers of the journey. Verses 10 to 13. No evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent, you will trample underfoot. Wonderful imagery. These verses seem to paint the picture of someone who is on a journey with the imagery of your tent and all your ways. This seems to illustrate our life journey through this world, which we conduct in our tent, these temporary bodies, and which we do in our own different paths of life. 2 Corinthians 5.2 tells us, For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. 1 Peter tells us that we are strangers, elect exiles in this world. We are traveling aliens, pilgrims in this life, and we are on our way to our real home. This journey seems to be going through treacherous places because of the imagery in these verses. It, it talks about evil, plagues, stones, lions, the adder. And in the context of our own journey in life, we see that this illustrates the world, which, was, which is fraught with evil and plagues, just like the imagery here. And the devil, who, by the way, is depicted often as a roaring lion or a serpent. No? 1 Peter 5.8 tells us, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And then Genesis 3.1, of course, we remember, it identifies the serpent who was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord had made. And he proceeded to tempt and successfully tempt and deceive the woman. The promise in these verses is that, and look at the language here, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. 
No plague come near. His angels to guard you. They will bear you up. You will tread on or you will trample underfoot. So you will be protected from the world and its system. And you will be able to overcome the evil one with the word of God. These verses tell us that our God who is loving and caring is also powerful enough to protect us from the evils of this world and the schemes of the evil one. Romans 8.37 assures us, No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now, please notice that verses 11 to 12 was used by Satan to tempt Jesus to jump off the pinnacle of the temple during his temptation, in order to test whether God would indeed send angels to bear him up. That's in Matthew 4, 6. It says, And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. So Satan quoted verses 11 and 12 of Psalm 91. But Jesus rebuked him. You know the story. And told him not to put God to the test. Verse 7 of Matthew 4. Jesus said to him, again it is written. And this time he quotes, this time he quotes Deuteronomy 6.16. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. You know, this tells us something very important. This tells us that just because God assures us of protection from the dangers, diseases, and deceptions of this world, this does not give us license or the liberty to test Him and to put ourselves in unnecessary danger. Sometimes, I am criticized for being too cautious about this COVID-19. Staying at home, keeping myself safe, keeping myself isolated. Because I am high risk. I am 59. I am overweight, obviously. I am diabetic. I have a heart problem and kidney problems. So if this COVID-19 hits me, I'm dead. So I am taking a lot of precaution. That does not mean I don't have faith in God. Because these promises do not give me the liberty to test him and to act cavalierly and put myself in unnecessary danger or risk. So, he who is secure in God, God is able to protect from dangers in the battle of life and from the dangers in the journey of life. But this does not mean that he always does this. Sometimes he allows trials to build us up. James 1, 2-4 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Why? For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect, mature, and complete, lacking in nothing. Sometimes he allows suffering to refine us. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 to 7. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Why? So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's why. Sometimes he allows pain to chasten us. Hebrews 12, 11. For the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. But all of the things that he allows, all of the things that he allows, whether bad or good, are actually all good. They're always good. Romans 8, 28 and 29 says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for what? 
good. For those who are called according to His purpose. And what's His purpose? For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. That's His purpose. And that's why He allows all of these things. So he who trusts in God is secure, and he who is secure in God, God is able to protect. Finally, he who loves God is saved. Verses 14 through 16. The beauty of this great psalm is that the application of its truths to our lives today are actually provided for us already in these last verses. First, it talks about his steadfast love displayed. The believer's steadfast love is displayed as follows. It says, because he holds fast to me in love. And then later on he says, because he knows my name. And then later on it says, when he calls to me. So these last verses, we find God himself speaking in the first 13 verses, it was the psalmist addressing his readers. Now it is the Lord himself, of course, speaking through the psalmist, who is addressing us. And he describes here what it means to be secure in God, in faith, and to be safe in his protection as his chosen people. What do all of those things mean? What do the first two truths mean? What does it mean? mean to be dwelling in the shelter of the Most High. Firstly, it means to hold fast to me in love, the text says. That means to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Deuteronomy 6, 5 says that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Jesus repeated that in Mark 12, 30. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. That means to give him first place in our lives. To submit to his will and obey him. To give all that we are and all that we have to him. To deny ourselves and to take up our cross daily and follow him. That's what Luke 9.23 says. And he, Jesus Christ, said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So firstly, it means to hold fast to me in love, to love God. Secondly, it means to know his name. It says to know. He says, um, because he knows my name. So to know his name or to know him through what he has revealed in his word, his power and majesty and wisdom, his love and grace and mercy, his justice and righteousness and holiness. Exodus 34 verses 5 to 7 records the Lord's um, description of himself to Moses. It says, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Then later on in the last book of the Bible in Revelations 5 verses 11 to 12, there's a description there of God that's wonderful. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and glory and honor and blessing. That's our God. We are to know Him. We are to love Him. We are to know Him through His Word. 
Thirdly, it means to call to Him in prayer. Let me read you a few verses. Psalm 17, 6, I call upon you for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me. Hear my words. Psalm 28, 1, To you, O Lord, I call my rock. Be not deaf to me. Lest if you will be silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. Psalm 55, 16, But I call to God, and the Lord will save me. Psalm 116, 2, 116, verse 2, Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. Psalm 141, verses 1 and 2, O Lord, I call upon you, hasten to me. Give ear to my voice when I call to you. Let my prayer be counted as incense before you and the lifting up of my hands as evening sacrifice. Matthew 6, verses 9 to 13, The Lord said, Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts that we also have forgiven our de- as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 to 18 says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So it means to love Him, to know His name, and to call Him. So love God above all. Know Him through His Word. And pray to Him at all times. This is how we dwell in the shelter of the Most High. Secondly, His sure salvation is assured. Look at these words. I will deliver Him. I will protect Him. I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. The psalm ends with the great assurance of blessing that will belong to those who will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Deliverance from the dangers of life. Protection from the perils of our way answers to our prayers, companionship in our troubles, rescue from our woes, honor for our labors, a long and satisfying life in this world, a sure salvation in the next. So beloved, he who trusts in God is secure, and he who is secure in God, God is able to protect. Finally, he who loves God is saved in this life and in the next. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your message to us tonight. Will you cause this to remain in our hearts and minds and empower us to obey, to have this assurance in our lives, to walk victoriously in you, knowing that we dwell in the shelter of the Most High. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's learn another new one. Let's worship our God. I said, sure and steady anchor in the fury the soul when the winds of doubt go through me and my sins have all been torn in the suffering in the sorrow when I sink he hopes are few I will hold fast to the anchor which shall never a short and steady anchor while the tempest rages on when temptation claims the battle and it seems the night has won deeper still then loves the anchor though I just leave stand accused I will hold fast
Beloved, please join me in a closing prayer and benediction. Father, we thank you once again for your word to us this morning, this day. We thank you for the comfort that it brings to our hearts. We thank you for the encouragement that we've received from you. And now as we close our worship service, will you bless all of us, Father, with your great love, with your great faithfulness, and with your Holy Spirit in our hearts. May the name of Christ be praised everywhere that we go, and may the glory of our God be manifest in our lives, now and forevermore. Amen. You go with God, beloved. Good day. We're happy that you can join us today. In case you need prayer, email or send us a private message via the GCF channels indicated on your screen. Send us a message before the worship begins or once it's over. A GCFer will try to reach you within the day. If you need to be prayed for over the phone, include your phone number so we can contact you. Thank you and have a great day.